You know, one of the big things that I hear a lot from people who don't go to church or who are not regular church attenders, I hear a lot of times people say, my faith is a private faith. I don't really need to go to church uh, to have faith. I can talk to God at home by myself. I don't have to be in a church building that has a lot of other people there. The disciples had to start by forming a community and by forming a unified message. And I think that speaks volumes to us today. We need to be a community. We need to be in community with one another. We need to talk about the message that we are to share. We don't have to agree on every single point of that message. But we do need to know the basics of the message that we find in the Gospel. The message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
proclaim the good news. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
Okay, and if you guys ever heard of Russian wind, maybe like right before a storm, when it gets real windy, because we can't usually hear or see the wind unless we can hear it when it gets really strong, can't we? But we really can't hear it on, a, like there's probably wind out there today. If we went out to try to fly a kite, probably if we got a kite high enough, we could fly a kite. But we didn't hear the wind. But this day, they could hear the wind. So people came to that area just to see what was going on. And with that wind brought these little flames of fire that rested over the disciples. Would you think that was crazy if that happened today? Yeah, I would think that was crazy, pretty crazy if that happened today too. So, and then with that wasn't crazy enough. All of these people could understand everything the disciples were talking about even though they didn't know each other's languages. So that was pretty amazing. And that was God sending his Holy Spirit to be, to be so that if you believed in Jesus, that it would live inside of you, and that you would have this ability to go out and share the wonderful news of Jesus with everybody. That's pretty exciting because you know what? The Holy Spirit is here with us today. And he's inside, it's inside of us, too, just waiting for us to share the wonderful news of Jesus with people who've maybe never heard that story before. So I've told you all before, I was a cheerleader back way a long time ago in high school, and I know Harper, she does cheerleading stuff because I see her when I go watch my granddaughter. So there was a cheer, and I don't know, Harper, do you know this cheer? I've got spirit, we got spirit, yes we do, we got spirit, how about you? And you challenge the other team's people to see if they got enough spirit about their team. Do you know that cheer, Harper? <laughs> Do you know that cheer? No, you don't know that cheer. Well, I thought maybe we could change it up today. Do you think you could do that cheer with me? Do you think Dad can do a cheer? Do you want to see Dad do a cheer? I think that would be fine. I think we should change it and say, we've got Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. We've got Holy Spirit. How about you? And to up today, congregation is a play along. So you guys get to say it back to us if you have Holy Spirit. Do you want to do that? You don't want to do that. Kyle, do you want to do it? Oh, Okay. <laughs> We've got spirit. Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. We've got Holy Spirit. How about you? We got Holy Spirit. Yes, we do. We got Holy Spirit. How about you? Yay! That was wonderful. Okay, let's say a prayer. to empower them 
to spread God's word, to spread the gospel. Uh, and, and it's an amazing story that we hear here in Acts 2 uh, that was summarized sort of by John. Richard had to do all the names of all the people last week. Uh, we didn't need to go through all of those again. But all these people were here. And so I have an awful lot to say. I guess the Holy Spirit has given me a lot to say about Pentecost. And for some reason, the Holy Spirit also told me that you guys didn't want to sit through a 30 or 40 minute message last Sunday. Uh, so instead, I decided, well, well, I got enough to say. I'll just, we're just going to do Pentecost continue uh, this Sunday. So it's not a 30 or 40 minute message this week either. Uh, I'll limit it a little bit and we'll get through a few more points that I want to make about Pentecost. And I hope it's something that we remember and that we carry with us for the entire church year. And actually, you're going to see in your bulletin for the next, I don't know, a lot of Sundays. It's like 20, 24 Sundays maybe that it's going to say, this is actually the first Sunday after Pentecost. And the way the church designates the like next 24 Sundays is the second Sunday after Pentecost, the third Sunday after Pentecost, the fourth Sunday after Pentecost, all the way up until, I believe, until um, Advent. Uh, so Pentecost season is a long season. So I think we can stand two Sundays uh, of having our red and celebrating Pentecost. Shall we pray? Gracious God, may the words of my lips and the meditations of all our hearts and minds be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Very briefly, let me remind you of, of where we are here. Jesus' disciples, including the newly selected disciple Matthias, were together in a house for a Jewish harvest festival called Pentecost. came 50 days after Passover. Uh, and before he had ascended into heaven, remember Jesus had been among his disciples uh, for a couple of weeks now, and before he ascended into heaven, which he's now already done at this point, uh, Jesus told his disciples to stay together, to stay together in community until the Holy Spirit came to be with them. So they all were staying together in one place as community, and they were gathered together in one house here to celebrate this uh, Jewish festival. You know, one of the big things that I hear a lot from people who don't go to church or who are not regular church attenders, I hear a lot of times people say, well, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm just not religious. You know, I don't know if you've ever heard that. I've heard it a lot. Or, my faith is a private faith. I don't really need to go to church. Uh, to have faith. I can talk to God at home by myself. I don't have to be in a church building that has a lot of other people there. Maybe you haven't heard these kinds of statements. I've heard them <laughs> at various times in talking to people about church. The author Jim Wallace states that faith is always personal but should never be private. Our relationship with God is a deeply personal relationship, but it should never be kept to ourselves. In his book, The Community of the King, Howard Snyder criticizes mainline Protestantism today by saying it has changed its emphasis from the spiritual growth of the community to the spiritual growth of the individual. Too often the church, Snyder says, is seen as a collection of saved souls rather than as a community of interacting Christian personalities. The church should not be a collection of saved souls that only comes together for an hour or so on Sunday morning and then we all go our own separate ways. That's not what a church is. We are to be a unified body of Christ. We are to love and support one another as Christ loves and supports us. And so we must strengthen our community and be joined together 
before we can really go out and try to make disciples for Christ. That's the example that the original disciples uh, showed for us. And it's the example, I think, that we are to follow. A church serves a lot of different purposes. And probably the first and, and most important purpose that we think about is to worship God. To come together as community and to worship God. But you know, when we do that, an amazing thing happens in that process. As we worship God, God is pouring out God's Holy Spirit on us. Hopefully to leave us renewed and refreshed. So just as the disciples needed to remain as a community, so the church today needs to provide us with that community where we can receive that empowering of the Holy Spirit as community. Church also reminds us that we're all unified as Christians. We have a common purpose, and that common purpose is to share the gospel message. The apostles had a unified message that they were wanting to preach to the world. Now they might not, even those twelve, might not have agreed on every detail of the gospel message, but they all had the basics down, as I believe we all do as well. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that Jesus Christ died, and that He was risen from the grave. Not only did they believe it, but most of them had actually yes. seen that happen in their lifetimes. And just as the disciples had that unified message, so we today, as the body of Christ, should have a unified message to proclaim. We don't have to agree on all the little fine details, but we should have the basics of the message down. The message is the gospel. It's the good news of Jesus Christ. And this message basically has not changed in over 2,000 years. It's the same today as when Christ Himself proclaimed it over 2,000 years ago. And just as those disciples were unified under the Gospel, so should we as a church community be unified under the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, in this story, while the apostles were sitting in the house together, the Holy Spirit did come upon them. The Spirit came in the form of both fire with that fire that seemed to, to sit on their heads, and wind, as John was talking about this morning. And those are two symbols of God that are used over and over again in the Old Testament, which Jews would have been very familiar with. You've got to remember, these are Jews that have gathered together for this feast of, the, of, of Pentecost. And so Jews were very familiar with those symbols of God, fire, and wind. God spoke to Moses as a burning bush. God came down in the form of fire to the wet offering left by Elijah to demonstrate God's power over, over all. God came in the form of a whirlwind to answer Job. So fire and wind were symbols that not just the apostles, but all the Jews that were gathered together at Pentecost would have recognized as symbols of God. The Holy Spirit descended and filled the apostles with power. The Holy Spirit actually gave the apostles a specific gift that day, which we read about. And, and, and there's some interest in that particular gift in the church is struggled with what that gift means and should we all try to strive to have that particular gift. The gift that the Holy Spirit gave was of course the gift of languages. The Spirit allowed the disciples to speak in languages that they didn't even understand in all different types of languages. Languages they had never spoken before. You know, God could have given the disciples any gift at this particular time to empower them with this message, uh, to help spread this message. He could have maybe given them the gift of, 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 of being large, huge people, 
standing out in the crowd uh, so that they would have been immediately recognized. He, he may, may have given them the gift of uh, being able to speak loud without even a microphone so that people could have been able to hear them. But no. The gift that the Holy Spirit bestowed upon the apostles was different languages. Different languages. Let's think about that. A bit. You know, my friends, we know that the message of the gospel has remained the same, has remained constant for over 2,000 years now. But how we proclaim the gospel message needs to change with the environment that we find ourselves in, with the audiences that we are trying to speak to, to relay this message to. Each audience is different, and the way we speak to each audience must always change and transform so that they can understand what it is that we're saying. You know, many different people filled Jerusalem on that Pentecost. And all of them were Jewish, but many of them came from different lands, and they did not all speak the same languages. Therefore, the opportunity was there for the apostles to share the gospel message with them, but they didn't have the right tool if they couldn't speak the language that these people would understand. They had the message, but no way to spread that message effectively among all the people. So the Holy Spirit gave them the gift that was necessary, gave them the tool that they needed to be able to share the gospel message with all the people that were, in prayer, that were present in Jerusalem during that Pentecost festival. And so that sort of indicates to me that we must understand our audience and adjust not the message itself. We don't adjust the gospel because the gospel is, always has been, and always will be the gospel. But we have to adjust how we speak that message to others so that they can understand it. And I really believe that's why the Spirit gave them that particular gift of different languages, even though they didn't understand it, so that all that were present in Jerusalem could understand the gospel message that day. So we can, we must understand our audience and, and adjust, not the message, but how we speak that message to uh, A quick example, if I were, if I had a short message that I wanted to give, and I was going to be speaking to a group of ladies at the retirement home, I wouldn't use the same language, I wouldn't use the same references that I might use if I'm talking to a group of teenagers and want to give that same message to them. You know, if I'm talking to teenagers, it's probably not going to do me much good to reference the Andy Griffin show or Doris Day. Uh, but those might be really good references to use with the ladies in, in the retirement home. If I'm talking to the ladies in the retirement home, I probably don't need to talk about uh, the internet and Twitter. Um, but, uh, you know, the teenagers, they're internet and Twitter, you must be old, we're way past that. <laughs> but, but you have to adjust. You have to adjust. Sometimes it makes it difficult in a congregation of a, a vastly different group of people to try, try to say, well, what can I say today that they're going to hear, that they're going to be able to understand? I have to adjust the way I talk to various groups that I talk to if we want them to understand what it is we're trying to say. So before we begin to spread the gospel, we must understand, first understand what our audience is, who our audience is, who it is we're going to be talking to. You know, it might be our co-workers, and we would address them in a certain way, and it might be our grandkids. And we're not going to address them and talk to them in the same way that we would our co-workers. So the Spirit will give us the tools that we need. We have to remember that the message does not change, but how we present the message, how we present it, it does need to change with the audience that we're presenting it to. And I think we have that example right here in Acts 2. And once the people hear a message in a way that they can't can understand, there's always some kind of reaction. 
If they understand the message, people are going to react to that message. Uh, the reaction can be similar to uh, most of those in the crowd. Uh, when the apostles began speaking in different languages, they were amazed. They were astonished. They couldn't believe they now hear this message in their own language. Or people can react negatively with skepticism, with cynicism once they understand what the message is. Most of the crowd in this story reacted positively, it seemed, but there, but there were people, there were people who reacted negatively. Some in the crowd that day were sneering and trying to poke fun at the apostles, saying, well, they, they must be drunk. You know, they've got to be filled with new wine. They're, they're obviously drunk. Now, I don't know how many drunken people you've been around, but any drunken people I've been around never started speaking in foreign languages, particularly ones they didn't understand or didn't even know themselves. So that seems to be a stretch here, but that's the point that's being made, that they're being cynical. They're saying, no, they don't really know what they're doing, so they must be out of their mind in some way or the other. And the best way they could categorize it was saying they must be drunk. But Peter, Peter, he sort of reacts in a, in a, in a, in a classical way. He says, uh, uh, he says you know, uh, uh, these men aren't drunk because it's only 9 in the morning. You might notice he's talking about the apostles. And he didn't say these men don't drink. He didn't say these men don't get drunk. Maybe they did. I don't know. And he just says it's too early in the morning. They haven't had time. They just got out of bed. They didn't have time to get drunk yet. Uh, so, you know, they, they can't be drunk. Uh, and I find it interesting that he doesn't say, well, they don't drink. Uh, obviously, they did. And uh, as almost everyone did at that time. And I, when we share the gospel message, I really think this is telling us we've got to be prepared for all kinds of reactions. For those who are going to react positively, and certainly those who are going to react very negatively as but, um, and that's very it's sometimes difficult to deal with that negative side uh, when we share the gospel story um, you know some might seem eager and, and want a deeper understanding of the gospel you know what does it really mean how does that affect me what, what could it mean for my life uh, but there are always going to be those who will try to blow you off they're going to say no nah, that can't be right no nah, You've been indoctrinated by the church all your life. You know, you don't know what you're talking about. But if we remain persistent in God's love and let Christ and the gospel message do the work, then we can be amazed and astonished ourselves at what the Holy Spirit really can do in the hearts and minds of people. So Pentecost, what was the result of, of that day? What was the result of Pentecost? Later on in the book of Acts, if you continue to read into the third chapter, you learn that 3,000 people, which is a huge number of people uh, at this time in the city of Jerusalem, 3,000 people made a commitment to Christ. These were not Christians. These were mostly Jewish people, of course, so they had a background in the Old Testament. But they heard this gospel message for the first time in a way that they could understand. And there were 3,000 people who committed themselves to Christ on that day. The church was founded on that day. And the foundation of the church is that message, is the gospel message. A message that never changes. That needs to always evolve in the way that we present it that message to others. The disciples had to start by forming a community and by forming a unified message. And I think that speaks volumes to us today. We need to be a community. We need to be in community with one another. We need to talk about the message that we are to share. We don't have to agree on every single point of that message. But we do need to know the basics of the message that we find in the Gospel. The message of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. If we do that, if we meet in community, if we begin to talk about the message that we are to share, the Holy Spirit
Spirit is going to be right here with us. And the Holy Spirit is going to empower us. The Holy Spirit is going to give us the tools that we need to share that message with others in a way that they can understand. <clears throat> the, the apostles prepared for any kind of reaction that they might face. So we also need to be prepared for those negative reactions as well as those positive reactions. The apostles were successful. Why were they successful? Because they had the power and the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And they accepted them and they used them. And the good news for us today is that Holy Spirit, that same Holy Spirit, is here today and that Holy Spirit has not lost any of its power. The Holy Spirit will give us the power and the tools that we need to share in the ways that we need to share the Gospel message with other people. We can be just as effective as the church founders on that Pentecost Sunday over 2,000 years ago. We only need to use the tools that the Spirit will provide to us. The Holy Spirit can light our fire just as it lit that fire on the heads of the apostles so many years ago. May God continue to empower this church to be led by the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our hymn of response this morning is Breathe on Me, Breath of God. It's found on page 393 of your hymn. We will sing all four verses. It's a short So let us now rise together body, Lord, and spirit, and sing, breathe on me, breath. Joy French is standing with Lisa this morning as the elder designee. 
opportunity to formally present her to our congregation. Joy, would you do the honors? On behalf of the session, as a member of the session, I now officially present for the recognition Lisa Palmer, who has been received by our session into membership of our congregation by transfer of membership from the First Baptist Church of St. Genevieve. Lisa Palmer, welcome to our church. Welcome to your church. Hear these words from Holy Scripture. There's one body and one spirit. Just you were called to one hope and one calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all, and through all, and in all. It's Ephesians 4. From 1 Peter 2, You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you might proclaim the mighty acts of the one who called you out of darkness into God's marvelous light. Sisters and brothers in Christ, our baptism is always a sign to us of the, uh, of the seal of an inward grace that God bestows upon us. Through the birth, life, death, and resurrection of Christ, the power of sin over our lives was broken, and God's kingdom entered into our world. Through our baptism, we were made citizens of God's kingdom. So my friends, I ask all of us, including Lisa, to remember our baptism and to keep it whole now and forevermore. Lisa, I ask you, therefore, to once again profess your faith in Jesus Christ to confess the faith of the church in which you were baptized. Do you, Lisa, turn to Jesus Christ and accept Him as your Lord and Savior, trusting in His grace and love if so, please respond, I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying His Word and showing His love to all others? If so, respond, I will with God's help. Lisa, you publicly reaffirmed your faith before this congregation this morning. So now I have one final question for you. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, sharing in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, through your study and your service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, please respond, I will, with God's help. All right. Shall we pray? Faithful God, you work in us and for us even when we don't know it. When our path has led us away from you, you guide us back to yourself. So today we thank you for calling your servant Lisa to this fellowship of your people. Renew in her and renew in each and every one of us the covenant made in our baptism. By the power of your Spirit, strengthen Lisa in faith and love that she may serve you with joy to the glory of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. All of you will have an opportunity to welcome Lisa as well because I'm going to ask her, I have to tell you this, but I'm going to ask you, to, I'm going to stop and pick you up on my way out if you'll join me in the back and people can greet you at that particular time. So welcome. You're the newest member of our congregation. You too, let me see. <coughs> we now have the opportunity to celebrate the Trinity on this Trinity Sunday as we are going to recite together our affirmation of faith in unison. As I said, it's a Trinitarian affirmation. And as we are going through it, please pay attention to the, to the three different aspects of God that we are, are being talked about here as we affirm our faith together. This is an excerpt from the brief statement of faith of the Presbyterian Church. Um, it's not the entire brief statement. Presbyterians can't be too brief, I guess. Uh, uh, but, but this is an excerpt from our 
uh, Presbyterian Brief Statement of Faith. Please, please join me in this affirmation of faith this day. In life and in death, we belong to God. Through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, we trust in the one triune God, the Holy One of Israel, who alone we worship and serve. We trust in Jesus Christ, fully human and fully God. Jesus proclaimed the reign of God, preaching good news to the poor and release to the captives. Unjustly condemned for blasphemy and sedition, Jesus was crucified, suffering the depths of human pain, and giving his life for the sins of the world. God raised this Jesus from the dead, vindicating his sinless life, breaking the power of sin and evil, delivering us from death to life eternal. We trust in God, whom Jesus called God, Father. In sovereign love, God created the world good and makes everyone equally God's image male and female, of every race and people, to live as one community. We trust in God, the Holy Spirit, everywhere a giver and ruler of God. The Spirit justifies us by grace through faith, sets us free to accept ourselves and to love God and neighbor, and binds us together with all believers in the one body of Christ, the Church. With believers in every time and place, we rejoice that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Gracious God, we offer you our thanksgiving for all the blessings you so abundantly give to us. 
from the martin soaring through the sky to the dawning sky that welcomes a new morning to the deep delight that overflows when we think, think of the ones that we love for all the gifts you grant to us O lord hear our prayers of cat gratitude we especially give you the glory our god for our receiving of a new member to our congregation this day we ask that you bless lisa and that she may find her place in ministry among your people here at First Presbyterian. In the quiet of these moments of this day, our God, we turn to you, hoping to sense you speak into our lives words of love and forgiveness, of meaning and grace, that we would recenter our lives in the things that are important in this life. For God, there are those among us who know the, the pain of illness and sickness, the, the uncertainty that tomorrow might bring. So today we pray especially for those mentioned by name at the beginning of this service. May your peaceful healing touch be with them and comfort them this day. Our God, help us to release all our concerns to you trusting in your goodness. And as we look to the week ahead, we know that we're going to need your guidance and your presence in our lives. So let this be our continual prayer that you lead us to seek you that we might be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. As you enter or leave the sanctuary, you will find offering trays on the table in the back of this room and near the door as you depart this place this day. That is the way in which we collect our offerings and tithes and offerings each Sunday morning. If you've not had an opportunity to drop your offering into the offering place as you came in, please take the opportunity to do so as you leave it once again. We thank you for your continuing contributions to the life and ministry of First Presbyterian Church. Hear now this offertory blessing. Almighty God, we bring you this day our tithes and our offerings, and we ask that you bless them, that you accept them to be used in the furthering of your kingdom throughout this community, throughout this nation, and throughout this world. We also ask that you use us, use our talents, use our gifts, use our voices and our hands and our feet, our whole being in your ministries of love and grace. It is in your holy name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn this morning is Shine in Jesus Shine, found on page 431 of your hymnal. We're going to sing the first and third verses. We'll omit the second one. So now let us rise one last time, either in body or in spirit, and sing together our closing hymn, Shine, Jesus, Shine.
enjoyed uh, having the Bouviers here with us this morning on the front row. Uh, and uh, congratulations on your wedding. And, uh, uh, that should be a, a wonderful event that takes place here before you. Uh, I don't know if you guys follow the weather forecast at all. It's supposed to get a little warm uh, in the next few days, so uh, be careful if you're doing anything outside. Uh, if it does uh, uh, get up to 100 degrees or so, as they're forecasting for a couple of days, it's supposed to cool back down a little bit before the wind. As long as it's sunny. As long as it's sunny. Well, I can't guarantee that, but we'll work on it. We'll, we'll see. See what, see what happens as far as that's concerned. So maybe a warm week and uh, maybe many things going on in your life that regardless of what's happening in your life, perhaps you're going to the Presbyterian Women's Luncheon on Friday. Remember to sign up for that if you do want to go and be a part of it. I don't know what would happen if you showed up without signing up. We'd pull up another chair. Oh, okay. <laughs> all right. So that tells me all I need to know right there. Okay. Uh, Whatever you're doing this week, I hope that you always remember that God will be right there with you. Because God provides us with His Holy Spirit to be with us at all times. Because God, God is always above us, watching over us. God is always below us, holding us up. God is always behind us to protect us. God always goes before us to guide us, to show us the way. God always stands right beside us to support us. To give us that shoulder to lean on, and most importantly of all, God and God's Holy Spirit is inside us as well to give us peace and joy. So go in peace this day, my friend. Amen.